Okay, we are now recording. All right, thank you, Stephanie. Um, and welcome everybody to the September 15th, 2023 meeting of the Town of Amherst Solar Bylaw Working Group. Um, <clears throat> hope everybody's having a good day. Um, and we um, have a lot to cover today as we're getting down to the end, end game, if you will. Um, and so what we want to do is really um, focus on the bylaw language. Um, we have a, a bit of a, we have an agenda, but then we also have a um, list of uh, issues that we want to address in the bylaw, uh, hopefully getting through today. Um, and then uh, have the opportunity to read through and work um, work through the entire bylaw from, from uh, the full document. Um, at um as we close this out at, at our next meeting um but let me um also just welcome attendees we have from the public um and for the record i guess there's uh six of them at least to start the meeting so welcome to you all um okay uh great so um what I'd like to do is um, work through the agenda and fairly quickly as we can. Uh, let me uh, also in terms of the, the minute taker, sorry. Um, I think Dan was teed up for today, um, but that's not gonna be possible. Laura took them last time. Um, I do have the person who took them the furthest into the past at this point was um, Bob. Um, so are you able to take minutes today? Yeah. All right. I appreciate that. Um, that. Um, good. Okay. And then... Um, we, uh, Stephanie sent around the packet uh, to us that included the agenda. Um, we have minutes to approve first. Um, Dwayne, we don't have the minutes from 8-4, but we do have the minutes from 9-1. Exactly, I was I was stumbling a little bit there because I, I know we I saw 9-1, but not 8-4. So, um, I guess eight four is still kind of being worked on a bit. I forget who drafted. I haven't those. received them yet. Laura, she she's aware uh, that she has to get them to me. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. So um, that'll be a bit ancient history when we review them, but um, we'll do that. Uh, but did people have a chance to look at the minutes from uh, last time uh, nine one? And do we have any comments, thoughts, or a motion to approve those, or desire to to go through them? Um, I'll move to approve the minutes of September 1st or 2nd? 1st. 1st. I second. Okay, and if I can have your approval or not by voice vote, um, please be sure to have your microphone open. Breger? Yes. Hanner? Yes. Jemsek? Yes. Brooks? Yes. McGowan? Yes. Okay, minutes are approved. Great. Um, okay. Um, all right. Uh, now for uh, staff updates, and then we'll have committee updates, and then we'll get into the bylaw. So, uh, Stephanie or Chris, any updates for us? I don't have any updates at this time. Chris, any on your end beyond? No, no uh, updates. The, uh, uh, what's on the agenda today? Yep. Okay, great. All right. Thank you. Yep. Um, yep. Okay. And then uh, staff updates. Um, Martha, did you have a? Well, I, I noticed uh, that Chris, I think, is giving a review of the master plan to the town, special town council meeting on, on Monday. Is that right, Chris? Might be interesting for us to listen to. 
That is right. It's essentially the same presentation that I gave last year. So if you, if you were there last year, you're going to hear mostly the same presentation, but everybody's welcome. Thank you. Um, I'll just, um, I think next, remind me, Stephanie, next Thursday is the block party for the town of Amherst. Sorry, yes, the 21st from 5 to 9 p.m. Um, encourage people to enjoy the town, celebrate the town. Um, ECAC will have a booth um, along with some other energy affiliated folks, but um, feel free to drop by the ECAC booth and say hi. Um, Janet? Um, next, or this coming, next Wednesday, um, the planning board will get a presentation on the um, application by Pure Sky to build a, um, a the solar array on the Colesland um, in North Amherst. And I think it's like involves, I think it's 10 acres of panels and 40 acres of forest clearing. And Chris has more to add. <laughs> um that's been rescheduled for October 4th. So I, I know oh. that the minutes of some recent planning board minutes said it would be on September 20th, but the applicant has chosen um, October 4th as a better day for them. So it will be on October 4th. Okay. Okay. Um, and then just to add, which is not quite in the context of this, is I um, Jake Marley had offered to um, do a tour of his dual use. And so I did a little emailing back and forth about what's a good date for him. And so um, Monday, September 25th, um, at one o'clock, he's offering a tour. I think he could probably change the date or time that time, but it was hard to find time. So I think that'd be great if people came. Um, the broccoli is growing and I, we've seen pictures of that and stuff like that. So it's an open invite to everybody. And I could send out like a reminder or Stephanie could before that. Janet, if you send me the info for everybody, I'll just make sure everyone has it. Okay. And then, you know, if it, if people need a better date, I think we could chop that too, but it, it was hard to find dates. So. Super. Thanks. Okay. Any other updates? All right. Good. Um, okay. So, um, well, we did prepare for today's meeting to try to keep us um, organized and scheduled was a um, a document that was in the packet, which was um, remaining topics for discussion. Um, would it be helpful to have that on the screen? We'll have other things on the screen, but uh, basically the idea is to, to go through the topics, the key topics that are remaining in a discussion today, um, we have some time frames that we want to try to stick to, so we get through this. Um, it includes look uh, issues on farmlands, forest land, uh, battery storage, stormwater management, construction, the, the section on construction, um, and then um, and then some, uh, and hopefully get through that today, um, and then we can uh, pick up. Uh, I think that would allow us then to sort of have a final draft that Chris has been putting together um, that we can re review in its entirety um, at the next meeting. Um, so have have people, do people have that document available, uh, Jack? Oh, I just had a question. Uh, what's our meeting schedule? For some reason, I didn't have today's uh, on my calendar. I just want to make sure we have the next well, we'll go over this at the end of the meeting, but you brought it up, so I thought I'd ask. Well, I think part of what we want to discuss at the end um, is what is our schedule between now and October 6th. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, if we if we continue with the every other week, um, that brings us to the uh, to the 29th. Um, and then we have sort of <laughs> that's the only remaining that's the only remaining meeting left if we stick with every other week. Um, I, I suspect I, I'm sort of inclined to think we need two meetings. Um, and so um, if we stick with the 29th, I guess there's a yeah, there's there's an issue because I'm not available the six. I'm out of out of the um, state. I'm in California. Um, 
um, so that wouldn't work. Um, so um, I'm not sure if we want to go through this now or um, at the end, um, depending on when we what we get through today. Uh, but I'd be um, open to trying to uh, find time for another meeting in addition to the 29th. Okay, Stephanie. So we do have meetings scheduled, including October sixth. We have the twenty, um, the twenty second, uh, or I'm sorry, the the next meeting in two weeks, which be the I'm sorry, the 29th and the sixth were the final two meetings. Um, but obviously, Dwayne, because of your schedule, the October sixth meeting sounds like we would have to reschedule. So officially, you do have two. It was including the sixth. All right. Yeah, I apologize for that. I'm literally in California celebrating my son's wedding. <laughs> uh, on uh, on that day, I, I, I'm going to be very busy that day. Um, so I have to find find another time. Um, let's okay. Let's just go quickly. Um, I didn't see the order here, but um, Chris. Oh, sorry. So continuing on with the discussion of scheduling. I am going to be out of town on the 29th. Um, I have a funeral in Ohio that I have to go to. So, um, yeah. Okay. Just well, wanted that... to let you know that. Okay. Janet. So very quickly, if Dan can't make any of these Friday meetings, I don't, I think we, we should think about, I don't know if we did this right now, but think about, I don't want to lose him as a member. Um, so I don't know if we need a different day or what, but I just wanted to, I, I don't think this can be ironed out right now, but I'm not sure if Dan's like, I think he has a class or something. So, and most of the day, most of the day Friday, um, and given that I'm, I'm not available on the sixth and Chris is not available on the 29th, um, Fridays aren't looking too good. <laughs> um, Martha. Uh, so are we going to wait and discuss this at the end or do you want to finish it now? Um, I guess while we're on it, I'm not opposed to finishing it now. I think we need two more meetings. Um, at least. At least. So. At least. I, I like to get two meetings scheduled. Yeah. Um, and I'm not sure whether this requires a <clears throat> doodle poll or, or, or what's a, allowable, uh, Stephanie, uh, in terms of scheduling a meeting. A doodle poll is fine. What would be helpful is if you all have some dates that you know, like we already know now that the next couple of Fridays are not going to work. So what would be helpful is if there are maybe a different day of the week that at least the majority of you are here can agree to, and then we could figure out times and I can send a doodle poll and that's perfectly acceptable. I'll send that up to the whole group. Okay. Yeah. So, so I... I strongly recommend that we start right now and schedule two meetings in September. Friday is the default if we can't agree on any other time, Friday the 22nd, but I urge you, Stephanie, if possible today to send out a notice saying we need two more meetings and with a, a doodle poll for uh, those dates. Is that sure. acceptable? I absolutely. Oh, Lord, shall I put it in the form of a motion? <laughs> Not sure if we need a motion. I, I think, um, yeah, if, if Stephanie, if you're willing to do that. Um, I just said that I was willing to do just that. So I don't think that differs than what I just said. So I'm willing to. I just need to know. But you need to have at least, a. you should at least come up with what I was su suggesting is that you find a day of the week that might work for everybody because then we can break it uh, break it down in terms of times or a few days. I, it seems like Friday, other than the 22nd, which we can include in the list mm -hmm. of potential dates and times, we can include Friday, the 22nd of September. But if there's other days of the week, that's what I'm asking you to maybe hone in on because it would be helpful to know, like if somebody absolutely can never make Mondays or Tuesdays or Wednesdays or Thursdays, it's good to know that. Yeah. Well, well, maybe the members present now and hearing this could right after our meeting could could send Stephanie your schedule. Tell tell her morning, afternoon for each of the uh, next days of the week. Would that be oh, okay? I, 
Yeah, I would take Tuesdays off the list, at least in September, while our solar forum's going on. Oh, yes, yes. Um, <laughs> and, yeah. Go ahead, Bob. Okay, um, on Mondays, I will volunteer at the Survival Center. I can't do Mondays. And then this coming Friday, the 22nd, since... There are very few Fridays. I've already planned travel out of state. Okay. So it looks like there, th Thursday. How about Thursdays? Wednesday or Thursday? Huh? Thursday um, after noon. Af after, after 12 o'clock p.m. <laughs> works for me. Bob, did you have something more? Yeah, so Thursday, the, the doctor to have my shoulder repaired. I have to be a mass general on Thursday next week. The 21st. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I figured this was going to happen. So, yeah. Uh, okay. We're, 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 um, Wednesday the 20th. Wednesday the 20th sounds good, right? Could, could we also look at evenings? Like maybe, well, I was going to ask that. I, did, did, there were like five o'clock. Five is like hard for people with young kids, but um, five thirty six, you know, one day or something. But Bob, you're saying no. Yeah, I can't do anything next week during the day because I have a class Monday through Friday, like all day class. But otherwise, I'm pretty free. So I'll be just sending out a doodle poll with different times. Yes. What I was trying to just get you to focus on was a day <laughs> and the <laughs> times would include evening hours as well. Okay. So I think what I'll just do is um, it sounds like Wednesdays, at least for the most part, are generally pretty good for people. Mm -hmm. So um, because next week, Friday, the 22nd, I know, Bob, you're not available, but I think you know, it's not likely that you're going to have the perfect date that everybody's going to be able to make it. It's very unlikely. So at the very least, what we're looking for is the majority of people. So we'll look for at least a quorum, if not more, and I'll get the results out to everybody. So I'll get that out at the end of this meeting. I'll work on putting that doodle poll together and getting it out. Okay. And do include the early evening. Um, yes, it will have evening times as well. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Stephanie. Okay. Figured that was going to be hard. Um, okay. Shall we jump into the um, remaining topics? Um, and let me... Um, um, Stephanie, do you want to be the share of the screen? Happy to. Are you looking at the draft solar bylaw remaining topics for discussion? Document? I thought we would look at that first. Uh, okay. And then as we jump into the each of the topics, we can revert to um, Chris's documents. Okay. I'm not uh, sure this is the latest version. I it think it have is. A, a V2 at the end? Um. Yes, it does. Yeah, right. So okay. I'll share that. I've got it up already. So just give me a moment. Super. Okay. So this was in the packet and this um, was um, courtesy primarily of Martha. Um, and thank you, Martha, for um, outlining this. Uh, it was, it was hers with then my um, hacking it a bit <laughs> um uh and main but maintaining what i also appreciate on this is the um uh, time allotments that she's provided us um unfortunately or not we have time constraint especially if our next several meetings are constrained uh in terms of when we can all be together uh and so we're going to try to stick to these time frames um as we go through these topics um and so we have some things to finish up with regard to farmland, forest land, and then some other issues. If you count up the hours or the minutes here, it's about, uh, if we scroll down, we can get to hopefully to, um, before it says future meeting, uh, through through these topics today, uh, and then be in good shape to 
uh, potentially talk about these other two topics to, in the next two meetings. Um, one is uh, what Chris has sort of put together with some ideas with regard to, um, apart from zoning, sort of the permitting process that we might recommend with regard to uh, solar development um, as a function of the zoning district. Um, and uh, uh, again, obviously this is for all large scale, large scale solar, not residential scale solar. And then, uh, and then a, a final meeting or meeting and a half uh, of um, trying to do a final pass through the entire document, which Chris has been putting together. Um, so that sounds okay. Um, let's move uh, back to the top of this um, and talk about farmland. Um, and maybe people, this packet is in your, this uh, document is in your packet. So maybe you can bring that up and have that available to look at as we then also look at um, and Stephanie, maybe it would be good to share the screen then on the on the um, farmland document. Okay, and it's in the packet, by the way, as and well on the top. online packet. Yeah, 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 for everybody. for folks. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing a second. Yeah. Okay. And what I also thought I would do is to keep us on track, because I'm not very good at that. Uh, Mar Martha, would you be willing to be somewhat of a timekeeper? Okay, I can try. I mean, what I recommend is that each of us have a chance to voice our opinion yeah. for each question that comes up, but keep it to an elevator statement. Exactly. Yeah, good point. Um, let's... We've heard lots of conversation and discussions and issues on these on on some most of these topics, if not all. Uh, but let's just uh, try to keep it to the pithy um, uh, issues that you want to bring forward as we sort of reach a decision on these. So um, on farmland, um, you know, I guess the one one of the issues, and I guess I'm reverting back to the remaining topics for discussion. Um, uh, but it sort of comes down here in the agrivoltaics required section. Um, uh, and as it's written currently, and I, as I recall the lawyer, um, his opinion was that we, it would be, we'd be hard pressed to make a requirement, but uh, we could have a strong encouragement um, and sort of a requirement that they do it unless they can demonstrate otherwise that it doesn't is not feasible. This is agrivoltaics um, on farmland on farmland. Um, so um, let's hear about that issue. Um, uh, people's uh, thoughts on that. So Bob. Uh, yeah, so I have already commented on these and I think everybody knows what I'm going to say. I do not think we need more restrictions. I think that if we we should encourage, possibly even reward, if there are resources to do that. I think farmers are hard pressed as it is. I'm not sure we should be requiring them to do anything. They will make the best financial decisions. All right, good, Janet. You're muted. Oh, I was gonna say, I think Martha was first, so. Um, where's Martha? Okay, there you are, Martha. Okay, go ahead. So, okay, well, I would favor the wording that says uh, that the farmland is the, uh, excuse me, that the agrivoltaics uh, would be required unless the developer or applicant can demonstrate that it doesn't make financial or technical uh, feasibility. Although I don't feel so strongly that I would insist on it, but there are my reasons are fourfold. One is uh, the state's goal of no loss of active farmland. Uh, the, the second is that I think that the wording here has uh, a good legal out 
that says, unless you can demonstrate that it doesn't make sense, and maybe we can make that not quite so strict. A uh, third is that since we're here in Amherst and UMass are the ones that are really working hard on the agrivoltaics, it seems to me it's a good opportunity for a uh, mutual benefit of increasing the, the data and the research and getting UMass's help uh, to farmers to actually do this. And the fourth is that I think that that was what uh, the respondents to the public survey favored. All right, yeah, so. good. All right, good. Um, I'm certainly inclined uh, and favorable on the language is basically written here. That is um, that we don't provide a restriction, but that we um, hold their feet to the fire to uh, to do agrivoltaics unless they can demonstrate that they can't. Uh, but not, but not uh, uh, overly restricted, and uh, as as Bob suggested as well. Um, okay, um, Janet. So um, I talked to Jake Marley about um, you know what, how much you know, you know, with the state adder for um, agrovoltaics, and he said that his company offers between eight to ten thousand an acre in terms of, you know, extra, you know, to the farmers. And I, then I also said, well, what if it was just a traditional array? And he said it was like two to 3000 an acre, you know, a hay field, maybe 900 an acre. I don't really have numbers on different vegetables, but it seems, you know, I, and I think when we talk farmers, we should talk about landowners and farmers often as two different people. And so I think for me, I, I think, you know, the, the requirement that of dual use if, you know, unless it's infeasible, which I'm not even sure why it would be infeasible on anyone's land. So that was one of my questions, like what would be infeasible, you know, if you can default to a hay field. And then um, the other question I had about this was why five acres was picked. But the other thing I really wanted to do is add language that, you know, not to, you know, we could require agrovoltaics unless it's infeasible for whatever reason, but also to require spacing for future farming. So it might not work for someone this year or next year. Maybe they don't have the machinery or something, but maybe in 10 years, um, you know, we're going to need that farmland more than ever, as we can see with the floods recently taking out, you know, the Hadley land. Um, so, and so I asked him like, what spacing do you need for agrovolcanics? And Jake said he thought like a, a separation of between the panels of 20 feet. Um, so they would still get money from putting solar panels in Obviously, you'd make less, but there'd be space for future farming. And so I thought that would be kind of a fail safe thing. But I really did wonder what would be economically infeasible because, you know, you said that your um, UMass is giving out, you know, certifications. There's a plan A, there's a plan B, you know, you know what I mean? So that's that's my elevator questions and hoping to add something to it, some information and an extra requirement of just the spacing allowing dual use. All right, I would just comment on that. Um, I don't think we need to put spacing or specific numbers in there. Uh, the state uh, um, eligibility requirements for agrivoltaics uh, has specifications that are designed to um, address these sort of issues, um, and particularly the issue with regard to the flexibility of the farm, so that um, uh, you know this is going to be a 20, 30 year. Um, uh, asset. So, you know, what's plan A, what's plan B? Uh, if this first crop, the uh, first agricultural process and, and crops that they're planning to grow does not work well in the environment, what can they do next? And, and, and to assure that the array is structured in space to have the flexibility to um, uh, uh, allow for a plan B and a plan C. Um, and I, I, I think, I don't think we're in a position to say 20 feet um, or or any specific number, but would leave that to the state design of the program, which is, um, you know, not not perfect or ideal, but there's no other state in the country that has looked at this as closely. Um, I wonder uh, if, so, Dwayne, you know, I, I love the state right now, and I, I, I admire, we have a great team really looking hard at this issue, but we don't know what future administrations would do. I'm not tied to 20 feet, but I wonder if we have some language saying, you know, so, you know, to allow future, you know, dual use or something, because right now we, we're all behind the state standards 
in 10 years, we could have a different administration. So some language sort of saying it needs to be open for dual use. Does, does that? Um, well, I think. Um... So that's, that's a suggestion. I, I, I think people should think about it because, um, you know, I always, I'm always in the world of what happens when things go bad, you know, cause that's the world of attorneys, but what happens when, you know, the administration has rolled back that program or isn't funding it anymore. Um, and, that, and that may be a reason why we wouldn't require it if it's not economically feasible. Um, uh, if they do roll it back, um, which I don't think there's a suggestion that they would, but, um, and it becomes economic and feasible, then it's not clear what these landowners, uh, what their options would be. Mm -hmm. um, okay, Martha. Yeah, a, a simple suggestion for how to do that is down under where we have agrivoltaics design and reporting requirements and the developer has to submit the plan, we could simply add a statement that the plan includes the spacing of the array. Then that takes care of the problem. We don't have to put anything else in would be my suggestion there to Yeah. Respond. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously the plan as it stands now for the state would include the spacing. Key yeah. mind, there's actually two two dimensions of the spacing. It's yeah. in, in between the rows, but also separation of the panels within the row. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the more important issue to some extent is what the state has is the no more than 50% shading requirement. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, and that that's not specifically to has doesn't specifically have to do with row spacing. Yeah. Okay. Row, well, row, yeah. That, so that, it sounds like that would take care of the of, of Janet's concern then, uh, if we just say no more than fifty percent shading. Um, well, I'm not sure if we want to say that in our rules. Okay. Um, if, if the state has that in their rules, and then okay. you know, and then the science changes to say, oh, right. you know, we really need sixty percent or forty percent, and right. the state changes the rules. That's better than us having to change the rules. Okay. Go ahead, Chris. I think Janet is suggesting that even if you don't choose agrivoltaics, that if you put a solar array on farmland, that you must comply with certain spacing requirements. Mm. And so you would not um, hearken back to the <laughs> AST, ASTGU because it wouldn't apply. Excuse me. Okay, yep. And then I actually am favoring, I'm in favor of general language without specific, you know, numbers, like percent shading or numbers, you know, and if we did put in a specific numbers, you know, the town also can later change with with the state's revised thinking. But I do think we can put something in general. And I'll, I'll, I could do is I can send some language out um, that might soften it or make it, make it more flexible, but also have a requirement that this land just can't be taken out of production because, you know, we all know the reasons why it shouldn't be. I mean, from the state plan, from the town plan, from the town residents' preferences, you know. And then also it keeps land open for farming for farmers that don't open their, own their land um, and, you know, who are not exactly a moneyed class and easy, it's not easy for them to buy farmland. Yeah, that, that being said, I mean, I, I guess I, and maybe to Bob's point as well, if, if for some reason the state does away with the agrivoltaic incentive um, and farmers can, because uh, with that, I think it would be hard pressed for um to demonstrate that it's not economically or technically viable, uh, but without that, uh, it could it it would very well probably be hard to justify as economically viable. Um, and um, uh, at that point, I'm not sure if if um, if we would um, not allow a landowner or for, farm owner to, uh, to to put up an array. Um, that seems to be a bit of a restriction um, on on their land use. Um, I do understand the points with regard to wanting to maintain um, food production, but it gets at the heart of the issue of of um, of um, over regulation, perhaps of the of the uh, landowner. Mm -hmm. um, thoughts on that, Martha. Uh yeah, again, again, I think what might, it might be covered okay down uh, for the other 
big, big, big point that we need to discuss in the next five minutes uh, mm. is down under the agrivoltaics design and reporting. Uh, no, under. Um, we have this. We have the statement that says, um, "Oh yes, design and reporting requirements number two, that says substitution of other agricultural uses uh, on prime farmland currently being used for food crops. You know, in order to accommodate um, the solar panels, is is prohibited unless." an equal or larger acreage of farmland not currently being used for farming is converted to the growth of food crops. And so it seems that would cover the situation so that if you want to put up an array in one place, uh, you simply then need to uh, have your you know, food crops grown somewhere else. Every farmer knows their land and they know where things grow best and where it makes sense. And that would also protect renters who are uh, you know, use five to 10 acres to grow food crops. And if the owner decides to put up solar panels there, that it would protect them if we had that mitigation requirement. And I think that would take care of the concerns we have uh, discussed in the past few minutes. All right. Janet, go ahead and then we'll move on. Trying to, trying to stay in the elevator. So, um, I, you know, any kind of regulation of property um, with a zoning bylaw is reducing the options of a landowner to do things on their property. So I can't open a copper, copper smelter in my yard um, and, you know, that I have lost some economic value. There's very limited commercial uses I can have my property because I'm in a residential zone. Um, so, you know, and pretty, so I just want to point that out, like, if you're against all regulation of property, we should, you know, you're not going to vote on any part of this bylaw. So we should, you know, it's, it would be reducing the economic, um, the economic, the money you can make from a solar array it doesn't take away from your ability to make uh, money from farmland. And, you know, right now, all the things are pushing for agrivoltaics, and you kind of be insane not to. But I think I think that requirement of leaving land open for future use is really important because they're not making any more farmland and the state is telling us to protect our farmland and expand it. The other part of my elevator speech is I sent Chris a couple of um, extra requirements that would go under agrivoltaics design and reporting. And I think I pulled that off of, I can't remember if it's Kip Kolenskis or Scott Cation, I'm kind of lost, right? I think it's Kip Kolenskis who does um, farm stuff. And so I, I'm hoping we can just send them out. I, you know, she can send them out to consider. And it's about like road widths and utilizing already compacted areas and, you know, eliminating, you know, it's just like very, very practical things that might feel like, oh, that's over-regulation. But I think when I was looking at them, I was thinking, you know, the audience for the zoning bylaw isn't just the person applying, but it's also the ZBA or the planning board who isn't going to have a knowledge of what specifics would work and what's important issues for farm soils and things like that. So there's like four of them. And so I'm hoping Chris could sort of send them out later and we could talk about it next time or it, people can mull it in between. I'm off the elevator. All right, you've hit your floor. Okay. Um, all right. Do we, we have, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, well, we need to wrap it up in the next. Yep, okay. Two, three minutes. Can you, Dwayne? Can you summarize what you what you think the majority well, feels? I, I think I think I hear that um, we'll keep we would keep the um, main section here that agrivoltaics for farmlands. Uh, well, we said greater than five acres, but there's a question about that. That's been an, an active farming for five years. That um, if they wanted to. Um, develop solar on that land, it would need to be agrivoltaics as defined by the Commonwealth. Um, and uh, unless they can demonstrate that it does not make uh, a technical or economic, uh, is not technically or economically feasible. Um, if in some, for some reason, uh, it's not economically or technically feasible, perhaps the state incentives go away, then they would need to demonstrate that um, a comparable amount of acreage uh, that is being lost from the solar array uh, 
uh, of farming is uh, that acreage is replaced somewhere else. Um, I'm not exactly clear whether that's on their own land or um, some mm -hmm. other land in Amherst or some other land in Massachusetts. Uh, I, 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 I'm not clear on that part. Mm -hmm. Janet. I have a quick, quick question. So when we say five acres, that's a five acre farm. And so um, it's probably going to be only about three acres of panels, right? Because of setbacks and spacing and roads and stuff. Is that right? Well, I, I would, I mean, I, I, I thought the five acres would be five acres of, of active agriculture. Uh, it could be on a 10 acre farm. So there may be plenty of, of uh, it, it may, it may, um, the solar array may, may hypothetically take up the full five acres and still have setbacks. Okay. I just, I would just, so I was wondering what the thinking behind that was, but that, um, anyway, so that's, but thanks for the clarification, or maybe it's not clear from the language there. Um, do we want a threshold of, uh, or is it any, any, uh, I mean, we don't want to implement this on somebody's backyard, um, garden that they've been actively farming for five years. Um, <laughs> Uh, that might be a, a, an eighth of an acre or a tenth of an acre. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, so, um, so I, the, yeah, yeah. So I figured five acres would be what's that? That's like a megawatt. That's a megawatt. That's you know yeah. fairly yeah. substantial. Um, maybe five acres is too large um, for this. I'm I'm trying to remember how many acres um, Jake's broccoli and Joe's broccoli crop broccoli patches. Yeah. Um, but um, that's probably less than an acre, or it's less than a megawatt, I think. Um, but yeah, I'm open to to what that should be. the idea The idea there would not to you know if it's a really small farm uh, that we're not that concerned about the net loss of farmland in that small acreage, um, and the economies of scale of, of doing um, agrivoltaics may be harder for very small projects. We didn't want to necessarily implement this for for small projects. That being said, this whole regulation only applies to 250 kW or greater. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe maybe we don't have to say anything about acreage. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And if it's over 250, then um, 250 mm -hmm. kW, then it it uh, it's applicable. Yeah. So what, our time's up. So maybe we should. Okay. Maybe I, I would suggest we do that. Just not mention the acreage, and and uh, if it's less than two fifty kW, then it's not really the zoning rules are not really applicable to that project, uh, mm -hmm. and that would be a quarter of an acre. Yeah. That would be um, no, that would be in about an acre. Um, yeah. Well, we maybe we should let Chris speak to that, and then yes. go on. The reason I chose five acres was because the um, state really looks at five acres as being a cutoff for an agricultural operation and yeah. something yeah. that is five acres or more is um is allowed to have some exemptions from requirements of zoning and things like that um mm -hmm. and so that's why i chose five acres it, so it doesn't you know it's not a magic number it's just a number that is kind of generally recognized as being a minimum size of a farm our bylaw, our zoning bylaw, doesn't have a minimum acreage for a farm. So you can, mm -hmm. um, you know, have a farm that's smaller than that under our bylaw. But under the state, it's five acres. But the state also recognizes two acres or more if you make um, $1,000 or more in income per acre per year. So, <laughs> okay. okay anyway, I that's I how I came up with the five acres. Okay. I guess, uh, you know, I guess I would have some, I mean, in this, in the, you know, maybe hypothetical case, but a case where, um, you know, it's a small farm, five, eight, four or five acres, less than five acres. Um, and there's really, uh, the landowner is like retiring. There's not really a succession plan. Uh, it's been in farming for five years, uh, but the farmer, does, the landowner, farmer doesn't know what to do with it next and there's no real succession plan um um i'm not sure if we would require him he may not be he or she may not be able to do agrivoltaics yeah uh, if um 
if they don't have a succession plan and plan to keep to to to, to keep it in farming um because agrivoltaics by the state for the state you can put them up high but you need to do active farming yeah. that was, you know that, that's in a case janet and then let's wrap this up i think we have a sort it's, of a, i think it's a really good point Dwayne. and i think probably at that point you could just call hyperion and say hey you know this might be a project can you work it because they'll probably find the farmer that could do that or, you know, lease it or something like that. But I think that's a really good point. I, I think maybe the clarity that the, the, for me, that what would make it clear is instead of saying um, any LSSPI that is over five acres, say any farm. So, um, you know, it's like, is it no. the array or is it the farm that you're catching? And I think what Chris is saying, it's the farm, like any farm over five acres runs into like a bunch of state regulations and it's the, it's the array it really is the array i was thinking of the array that's over five acres I think so okay yeah. so then so I the think, yeah so i think maybe okay so that's that's clearer in my mind and I, I i hope the language captures that yes okay okay okay, okay. all right good i think i think we're making progress uh, was there anything else that we didn't cover on the farmland no, those those were the main yeah, things. That really I, covered it. Okay. Yeah. All right. So. Um, yep. Go ahead. Um, shall we move to the um, forest land, forested land? So you didn't have something about forest land in your packet this time, but I did email the latest version of it to um, Stephanie this morning or like a half an hour ago. So if Steffi can find that in her email, we can look at that. I think it was in a past packet, but I just forgot to put it in this packet. And I guess we had these on the um, topics remaining for discussion. We had a few bulleted items that we can walk through in the meantime. Um, I'm working on it. Just uh, give me yeah, a minute. yeah, yeah, yeah. No worries. Um, so Martha said to emit the entire soil requirements section, which I think makes sense for forests, because when you go in there and you start removing the timber, and then you remove, um, then you grub the soil, you know, grub the tree roots out. You really do disturb the soil quite a bit. So putting in place um, requirements to conserve the soil is hard to imagine and it's hard to enforce. So I think it probably doesn't make sense. Um, so that was one thing. So Stephanie, mm -hmm. if you can move this down to the next part, this is the next statement. So um, <clears throat> starting with ecosystem protection, um, for all LSSPIs, there shall be no forest clearing on land designated as core habitat and critical natural landscapes on Massachusetts GIS Biomap 3, or on land designated as priority habitat, habitat or estimated habitat as defined by Massachusetts Endangered Species Act. So um, this could be controversial, um, but maybe not. I spoke with Erin Jacques, um, who's the wetlands administrator, and she thought that this language made sense in a forest area that you would not want to have um, solar arrays in these places, but people may argue against that. So I'm just putting that out there. <clears throat> Any thoughts on that? Um... Jen, is that a new hand? Yeah. What is a critical natural landscape? Is that? It's something that's connected with um, the biomap. And um, I, I attended a webinar that talked about what core habitat is and what critical natural landscapes are. And when I look at a map of Amherst, um, the area of core habitat and critical nat natural landscape isn't very large. Mm -hmm. um, Aaron showed it to me on a map. And so I thought it would be reasonable to um, include that. Is that, and so, you know, I I understand like the endangered stuff, but it, in looking at the north um, west corner where there's a lot of forest land, does that encompass a lot of that or none of that, or just 
is some it, of it. It encompasses it, some of it. Is it is it larger than the um the the stuff that's protected as um drinking water supply? Is it larger than that? It's not really connected to drinking water supply. It's different. It's a different type of map. I guess I'd like to see that and see what we're protecting and not protecting. That'd be important. Okay. Is this, is this the biomap? I do have a I do have a um snippet of the biomass my biomap map <laughs> for Amherst. Uh though in honesty, I did that a while ago and I don't know if it's biomap three specifically. I don't I'm not as from that familiar with those that work um nor whether it includes the priority habitats and and uh, uh and so forth but uh, but yeah it is um there are sections of amherst for sure uh but it's not it, it, it's limit it and it covers some areas of the north east uh but but not all for sure i think if you go yeah. online and you look up biomap you can explore it and see where um, these two areas are in Amherst, if people wanted to do that. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have that readily at hand. Yep. Jack? Yeah, I'm just looking for a link or uh, rather than what do, what do you want us to do? Uh, Google, Biomap, Amherst, Mass. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if I, yeah, I can share my screen and show you what I did a, a couple of weeks ago. Okay. Uh, uh, unfortunately, it's not, the, if Jack, if you want to, in, in the meantime, try to draw, draw up the interactive map. I just got the map focused on Amherst and then did a, a, a snippet of it. Uh, okay. So it's not interactive, um, but I can share that um, yeah. in the meantime, if I, um, I'm not sure if I can unshare you, Stephanie. I think I might be looking at it on my phone, but it, I'm not going to be able to screen share. I apologize. I just had a call that I had to take. I'm sorry. What was if, that going? If you can unshare so I can share. Yeah, you can. You would knock me right off, actually, but that's okay. Oh, I'll okay. stop sharing. All right. I don't want to be rude. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. I would not be, take offense. <laughs> okay. Uh, so... This you can see Amherst in here, um, and this I, truth I'm a little bit, again I just I I don't know what the light green is versus the dark green. Uh, but these were the areas that came up as bio in in biomap. Yeah. I believe that the dark green is the um, core habitat, and the light, the dark green is the core habitat, and the light green is the, um, cool. what is it called natural, the natural landscapes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it's really only a small area. You're right. Yeah. I mean, this, this I think is the Mill River area. Mm -hmm. Is obviously the um, mountains or whatever, Holyoke Range. The mountains. And then that's Lawrence Swamp. Yeah. Right. Okay. Lawrence Swamp. Mm -hmm. there. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of area along the rivers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. It looks like it encompasses a lot of the Northwest section that people are so concerned about, especially our loyal followers in the audience. Northeast. Um, yeah. Northeast. North sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So, Don't follow my directions anywhere, please. <laughs> <laughs> so it makes, so it makes sense to me to leave this requirement in. What do others think? Um, I, I'd be in favor of that. Um, I think it's aligned with um, sort of what I've been hearing, obviously from from some community members as well as um, uh, sort of maybe shifting state priorities to try to really um, uh, minimize uh, to the extent that we need to um, work with some natural lands to try to minimize the damage or the impact uh, associated with that. Bob? Yeah, I'm fine with that section. Uh, those requirements are common in the Wellness Protection Act, so it's really nothing that's really that new or unique. Mm -hmm. All right, super. All right, let's go with that. Okay, before. so we'll leave that I, in for I, now. 
Before yeah, anybody yeah. gets on the elevator again. Okay. <laughs> All right. Good. On to the next. So, okay. uh, Sorry, so Stephanie, Stephanie's can you going to bring the, 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 the uh, forest language? So. So the only other topics that that I had thought were important was the was the state the mitigation of yeah here the pres preservation of forested area elsewhere that having that requirement in. Well, why don't you go back to the bottom of the preceding page, and we can talk about whether we should um, say uh, anything about what this says is um, that cutting of more than either five or 10 acres for the purpose of installing these solar arrays shall be prohibited unless the landowner does X, Y, and Z. So yeah, what do you think about the five or 10 acres? I'm inclined to go with 10 acres, but mm -hmm. that's a topic that you guys, you all should um, discuss. Mm -hmm. Um. Go ahead, uh, Janet. So I, you know, I, I haven't, I'm not, I haven't seen the project on Shutesbury Road that has been proposed, but it's 10 acres of a um, panels and 40 acres of clearing. And so um, that's a lot of land being opened up. And so I was, I was happy to see the five. I, I think Belchertown has five and that's past muster, at least with the AG. I don't know if it's going to get challenged to the SJC, but um I don't know. I thought five was less. And, you know, we're talking, you know, if you're talking about grubbing, you know, 20, 30, 40 acres of land, I think that's a really substantial change to the ecosystem, to the groundwater. We're at that point, just, we're not helping on the forest, the goals of the forest, you know, preservation. Um, you know, I mean, if you can find and create, you know, 20 or 30 or 40 acres of forest somewhere else in Amherst, I guess that's your mitigation, but I don't think that's going to happen. So I, I was, I thought five was good because then it would be like 10 acres of clearing and hopefully not 20, but I'm not sure how would, you know, why that was one of my questions to the planning board is like, how do you get 10 acres panels and 40 acres of cutting? So realizing that might be a possibility makes, makes me hesitate to go to 10. Well, this is cutting of five acres or 10 acres and then assume mm -hmm. that the array is going to be smaller than that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'd be I, I, I'm a little bit re resistant to go as small as five and, and would be inclined to go with 10, but interested uh, mainly because um, uh, I think most of the projects will be 10, <laughs> uh, uh, which may be a reason to, to have this in here. But, uh, you know, just the economy of going in and, and doing this work is you're probably talking about larger arrays and we want to um for various reasons interconnection and so forth um and um you know if we want to uh um okay yeah so let me hear from martha uh, yeah okay first of first of all we're saying that it's in the residential area right oh, that's it's not anywhere it's in the residential area so that already means that it's an area that's going to, you know, impact people where they're living. And so I would vote for the five acres because what we're saying is down further then is if you're going to clear cut a larger area, then you need to mitigate it somewhere else. So we're leaving an option open, I think. So that's my vote, five acres. <laughs> I'm confused. Um, I, I was just I was looking at the zoning, sorry, the uh districts. Um what do you call them? Zoning districts, Chris, sorry. Um uh, designations um on a map I found in Amerson. While the residential RO residential um uh outlying uh it does imply that there's residences around there, it's pretty low density. Um uh along the roads and there there's um certainly could be well away from homes themselves um in those districts um uh but still in the ro districts which are pretty prevalent uh in in the region 
Go ahead, Chris. Those are our biggest districts. And yep. just because they're called residential doesn't mean they are residential. So most of our farmland and forest land is in the RO or RLD. The other big districts um, would be the PRP, Professional Research Park, um, which is pretty big, but most of the other districts are relatively small, except for, you know, general residents and, you know, things that are close into the center of town. So it covers a lot of the forested areas and the farmland areas to say RO and RLD. And it doesn't necessarily imply that it's near housing. And I think um, in order to actually have an array that's worth anything, you probably have to clear at least 10 acres. So I feel like we don't want to make this so onerous that nobody is going to want to build solar in Amherst. We want to in some ways, you know, encourage it, but not encourage it to be too impactful. So I think 10 acres is a reasonable number. Yeah, okay. Um, I, I tend to agree with the 10 acres uh, for those reasons as well. I know there's um, views on the other side or at least going smaller, but uh, Jack, yeah, be good to hear from others. Yeah, uh, I, I I would lean toward uh, the 10 acres. I'm just thinking five acres are, you know, the size of a, some residential lots and a, 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 a subdivision in, in places. So, um, yeah, so I agree with 10. Yeah, okay. I concur to the majority there. All right, Bob, Bob. yeah, Bob. Uh, yeah, um, I, as you probably can guess, don't agree with this whole section. I'm not sure we <laughs> should be prohibiting five, 10 or any acreage. I mean, I it, I have no problems with regulation, but this restrictions or letting them buy their way out is just abhorrent. I just can't agree with this at all. Okay, but let me, let me also just be clear, uh, Chris. This is we're setting this up as as uh, not a restriction, but if you do more than ten acres, then you have to do these various things. That's correct. Yeah, but I, I get your point, Bob. That that's still. Um, uh, it depends, and we'll get to those things in a moment. <laughs> but uh, it's it's still um, more substantial regulation than saying than not having those. Yep. Okay. Janet, yeah, go so, ahead, Janet. One last, uh, you got a short ride up to the fifth floor. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> I'm at the penthouse floor. So I'm actually looking at the zoning map. I, I you know, I'm, I, it's not going to help me to hold it up to you, but I don't even thought, think there's that much land left of forested land. I could think of some UMass lands that are off of um, Northeast Street and then, you know, parts of off of um, Henry Street and think behind that and stuff like that. So I don't I don't think is, there's that many lots that would fall into these categories to begin with. So just just that perspective. All right. OK, let's I, I, I'm hearing the 10 acres uh, as a uh, I'm not sure about a consensus, but at least a majority um uh at this point so let's go with that but then let's um um chris what was your were you going to go through that oh, the what, next the yeah. next part is um to talk about if you do clear more than 10 acres then um should you be required to set aside um, an equal amount of land somewhere else either in amherst or in a town abutting amherst um and just to give you a frame of reference, Shootsbury requires a four to one um, designation. So if you cut an acre of forest in Shootsbury to put in solar, then you're required to preserve four acres elsewhere. <clears throat> um, and I think there's another town that does the same thing and I'm trying to think if it's Belcher town or not, but anyway, it is something that other towns do and it seemed a reasonable mitigation to me, but that's up to you to decide. Mm -hmm. I guess I would make a comment on that first, and then Janet. Um, I'm sort of inclined in in some uh, to go in this direction to some extent. Um, hearing sort of what I've been hearing from the the uh, state and and certainly from constituents, 
Um, I guess I, um, I question whether the solar developer and the land owner or the applicant, I should say, um, is in the best situation to find the, the and preserve the the best the the forest land uh and and particularly the best forest land possible uh to preserve or whether that's best left to the town or a land trust uh and whether this should instead which i think may be the or after this is that um some payment in lieu um i guess uh, is the terminology would be required from the developer so that uh, that's then paid to either a land trust or the town so that they and with some rules about that so that then they use that money to really target that forest preservation in an, in an area that um is is well chosen uh, so that was that sort of was my um thought or at least idea on that um janet so I think all the towns around us have a four to one um, set aside requirement. I think it's like, I, I remember that chart that um, Doug Marshall made. I think one for one is, is is um, it's not, first of all, buying up the development rights to forest land isn't that expensive. Um, it's not um, as valuable in terms of as far as, as ag land. Um, so I would do a higher requirement. And, you know, I think that pretty much, you know, it's not that hard to find land nearby that, has still has the development rights on it. And, you know, we could get some guidance from land conservation groups. You know, I know they're trying to put together big pieces, you know, to preserve um, a big chunk and they're trying to get some land to be, you know, you know, re returned to like a wild land. So I think it wouldn't be hard. I'm sure they, if a, a person with a project person could easily find acres nearby or adjoining, um, you know, in our, in our area that they could buy up rights to, or you know, temporarily, probably permanently, but it's not that expensive, relatively speaking. Go ahead, um, Martha. Okay. Well, I would strongly favor, say, a two-to-one mitigation. And uh, what I read from KP Law was that that had passed the uh, AGs. Uh, approval in other places. And um, I am strongly against the or payment in lieu. I think that's 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 wrong. That's ineffective. Uh, it opens a can of worms. When we talked about this in a previous meeting, everyone said that was a quote can of worms, I think. And it seems to me, I agree with Janet, it's, it's not that hard to find other farmland that you could uh, buy up or donate. I mean, we do in practical sense, have one large landowner in this general regional area uh, that could, uh, if it's a different developer, they could uh, buy up some of that land to, to set aside, or that land could be donated to the Kestrel Trust or another trust, and you could get a good tax write-off in the process. And so I strongly favor keeping number one and as I say, my preference would be a two to one, but not having the option of just a payment in lieu. That's ineffective. It dumps things on the town. The town doesn't have that great a reputation for really following up and it puts a burden on town staff. Uh, I, I I would just go to, with, with number one. I guess on number one, I, I guess, um, depending on how it's written, I mean, how, yeah. how do we, it may be easy to buy land locally but um i'm not sure if we want to limit it to amherst uh or how what the sure. geographic limit would be and what's to keep them from buying land further away than 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 we'd rather them do um i guess that's one one point but i i get your point and uh um you know maybe it's it's a it, it's some language about that they have to the uh, the applicant has to purchase this land set it aside but it has to be in some way approved as by the town uh uh as meeting meeting requ certain requirements i don't i don't i'm not sure if i'm overthinking it uh i would be inclined also to go with the two to one um four to one seems a bit uh like well beyond the net lo net loss criteria that we're looking uh, looking to achieve um and um 
Um, I had one other point, but I'll have to get back to that. <laughs> um, when I think of think of it. Um, yeah. And it gets two to one and not the, not the. Yeah. I guess, yeah, I guess the other thing is um, this is for 10 acres or more. Yeah. Uh, I do wonder whether um, it would be a side note. Uh, you know, I think there was some, some uh, issues raised maybe by the lawyer as well. I don't know, but you know, is this, is this, are we um, picking on solar developers as opposed to any other developers uh, in this, uh, on this issue uh, and whether there should be a, a side note to the council uh, or the manager that while we're suggesting this to be this, the, 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 um, a, a, a bylaw uh, that the council uh, should consider a similar requirement for other development that takes more than 10 acres of, of forest land. That was, that, was, good. that was what I was thinking of. <laughs> yeah. oh, okay, well, according to my little watch, we're okay. about out of time. So does okay. anybody have final comments on, on any of this? Or? Janet. Um, I, I, I wanted to, I want to take a little time, you know, before our next meeting to ponder the soil changes. Um, and that make, it makes me want to go back and look at what the rest of the bylaw requires. I know we're requiring to save topsoil and things like that. So I don't want to have the bylaw repeating things over and over again and looking so dense. And so I just want to, you know, reserve a little time to look at that. Um, I wondered if we wanted to do a requirement to use the wood, you know what I mean? Like a lot of times people just chip and that I think um, Jonathan Thompson made that point. Like if you're not using the wood for furniture or something permanent or building, you lose all the carbon that's sequestered. So we might put a statement saying, you know, strongly favor, encourage, you know, part of the mitigation is to save, you know, as much wood as possible and things like that. So that's something I was just thinking about. I'm I'm glad you brought that up, Janet, because um, that was actually um, something I had thought of before, and I think I raised that many many months ago when we were looking at this before. Um, to some extent, I feel like um, from what I know peripherally about foresters and forestry, that if there's merchantable good merchantable wood is is quite um, valuable, uh, so that will generally make its way to the marketplace. Um, uh that being said um on the margins it may not be um as uh as um you know it's a lot easier to chip it up <laughs> uh in many ways so i would i would again i i don't as you say i'm not sure if there would be kind of a strict requirement to have to but uh i would you know maybe maybe some statement that there needs to be within the applicant needs to dem needs to report to the town in its planning documents um, of what it's uh, how it's going to make use and and uh, of the wood that's harvested from the forest and to demonstrate that they're maximizing the extent to which it is merch merchantable um, and um, off offered into into market sec sectors that would se maintain sequestration of that wood. Yeah, I, I I'd be inclined to add that. I did look at Jonathan's calculator and that I I actually played with that that yeah. specific uh, lever or whatever. It was it didn't as make as much of an impact as I thought it would, uh, but still it helps. Okay. Okay. Well, All Dwayne, right. we have time now. We have half an hour, which is time for one more topic. So we need to choose battery storage or stormwater management. Um, I'd make a plug for stormwater management because I haven't written anything on battery storage yet. Sounds good. <laughs> okay. All right. I'm pulling that document up. Yeah, Just thanks. Take a minute. Yes. And, and Stephanie, you have that, what I sent you about the four principles that uh, I, I do, you... but I can't. Um, yeah. I was going to just show this first. Okay. I think, or I don't know how you want me to do that. Well, that's up to Chris, I guess. Yeah. So, 
Well, we can look at what um, what Martha sent, but I think um, the two things that are shown here are um, <clears throat> the first part in black. Those are uh, regulations um, and laws that people have to follow when they're developing land in Massachusetts and in Amherst. And so there's a lot that's already been written about, you know, types of erosion control devices and how do you control sediment and, you know, lots about stormwater management. So I don't really feel like it's necessary to rewrite all of this. And if we did rewrite it, we would be writing a book <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's not really what a bylaw is about. So um, I put together this list of regulations and laws, and I had Erin um, Jacques, the wetlands administrator, look at it, and she thought it was a reasonable list. She added some things to it, and she said that we should probably add links to these references, which I think makes sense. So rather than, you know, reinventing the wheel, um, just having these references in here and saying that these solar arrays need to comply with these requirements, I think is reasonable. Um, <clears throat> however, uh, the red writing down below is in response to um, concerns that were raised about drinking water. So the Water Supply Protection Committee did have specific um, regulations that they recommended in order to protect drinking water. So I think we probably want to review those. But I wanted to get a general sense from you that um, the items in black were sufficient. In other words, when we allow um, you know, a, a shopping place to be built or a, a subdivision of homes, um, these are the documents that we rely on. We don't specify in the zoning bylaw how to control erosion and sedimentation and stormwater for all of these different kinds of um, of developments. So I didn't think it was appropriate to, you know, to get all that specific about these things. Um, so I just wanted to get some sense of uh, consensus that you all agree to the black writing here. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Martha. Yeah, you asking us to agree to have only the black and none of the red? Is that what no, you're... I'm asking you to agree to have the black with um, the links to those documents. And then in addition to that, to have the specific requirements for drinking water resources that are in red. And that was something that Jack brought up in an email that he sent out this week. He thought these things were very important. So... Um, I added them to this section. Mm -hmm. Just scroll down just a couple of lines to just see, see the see the rest of it. Yeah, yeah, I think those were good. And uh, then uh, I like the one of of phasing things in so you're not disturbing more than ten acres at a time. And the other thing uh, that I might suggest is that we could include here maybe the. the from the original forest land section that we agreed we were just going to shorten, uh, where we wanted to say that we left a certain margin of uncut forest land next to residential properties or, or, or something. Is that in here or do we need to add that? Um, that is not in here, but I did include it somewhere. Let's see. Somewhere. Yeah. There's so many okay. versions of this floating around. I, there were two sentences that I put into the forest section having okay. to do with um, setbacks. And okay. I will bring Even. those, I will bring those back to the surface um, for our next meeting. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So I like the, and uh, on the slopes business, we're going to say that we're just going to stay with our 15%. I think that's reasonable. I think 33% is, um, you know, and yeah. it is something that you see in developments, you know, particularly when you're putting in a road, you would see yeah. three to one slopes and you can mow a three to one slope, but 
yeah. given all the disturbance that goes into putting in solar arrays, it seemed to me that 15% was more reasonable. Yes, because it may take the vegetation a while. I mean, like even a few years to really get, you know, a step well established. Yeah. Okay. So some of these things in red would probably apply to all solar arrays. Um, and mm -hmm. specifically, it would be the slopes and the one right below it to limit land disturbance to areas of 10 acres or less. So those two things should probably be put um, elsewhere in the bylaw for all solar arrays. These things in red just relate to solar arrays that are potentially in uh, an area where drinking water supplies are potentially threatened. Okay. Yep. Okay, so the, um, I guess, and then we'll go to Jack for in, in, in a second, but I, I, I guess I have some questions about the 10 acre limit uh, for so the idea would be that you have to phase this project, so you do ten, 10 acres at a time, essentially. And and what are we talking about? The whole array is basically constructed on 10 acres, and then you go to the next 10 acres. Um, that I I guess I wouldn't mind getting Lars input on that. Um, I don't know what that may have some serious ramifications on the logistics and and, and economics associated with installing solar, uh, to the extent that you have to bring some specialized equipment on numerous times um and and then and then uh, get your crews out there to do certain things um in, at several different times as opposed to at, at one at, at, for for one swipe at it uh, i do get the 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 issue with regard to um constraining the the impact um but um i guess i i i hadn't what is there precedent for this in other communities or or uh, or the solar industry? I guess I wouldn't mind hearing from Laura on on her take on that. That would be a good idea. I think um, it comes from talking with Aaron Jacques about um, development of solar, and she recommends that you clear and grub and stabilize and install. 10 acres, and then you move on to the next one where you clear, grub, stabilize, that seems like and double, install. Doubling the logistics of, <laughs> or, or, or more than doubling. So uh, that it's kind of like the um, preservationist, conservationist, you know, is talking to the solar installer and they're not in the same place. Yeah. And so we yeah. need to come together about what we want to do here. Yeah. Okay, Jack. Yeah, I, I don't um, recall, you know, the where the, the seed for this idea came from, but I guess uh, um, there seemed to be some limit in terms of putting the brakes on it in terms of how much develop, because, you know, the larger the area, the more likelihood of some sort of sediment and erosion control malfunction happening. And that sort of thing. So it kind of, I guess the attitude was to keep it, you know, to put some limit, it doesn't have to be 10 acres to give me some, some other number, but uh, to kind of phase it in and just, and heighten the control and make sure that the sediment and, uh, and erosion controls are done properly. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's what we gathered from, from the, uh, the project that went, uh, went badly in the area uh that they they i don't think they were t i think they were larger than the 10 acre sort of thing and just kind of out of control and it, it just didn't get the focus on the project that it probably should have mm -hmm. I, I, I it's it's been a while but i think that's the the, the you know the the rationale for putting in any limit whatsoever to the land disturbance at, at any time and then the I would have a question. Um, so if you compare this, well, I, I shouldn't compare it to any project that's coming before us, but um, some projects would propose that you clear, grub, stabilize a pro uh, an area and then move on to the next area, clear, grub, stabilize, and do that until you are 
you know, till your whole area is ready for installation. And then you come in and you install in the first phase and you install in the second phase and you install in the third phase. So that's, that's the mechanism that seems to be most agreeable to the developers. So it would be interesting to hear from Laura about is that the way we should go? Or is this idea of doing the whole thing, you know, completing the whole phase and then moving on to the next one? Yeah. Okay. I get, I, I do get the issues. Um, I guess I, you know, one thing that we, I think would need to hone in on what does it mean by um, um, what, what, what constitutes a phase? Is it all the way to the array construction and then you move on to the next one or is it that stabilizing uh, uh, and then allow the, the, um equipment to just come back and do the next uh set of acres and so forth and then and then have the array constructed um all together on all two or three phases um sort of one after another so i guess if we do have something along these lines it'd be interesting to hear from laura of, of what the appropriate break should be in these phases all right go ahead martha i, I think one of the problems is these uh, relatively recent and ongoing torrential rains that that happen, like look at what Lemonster just in the past couple of weeks and so on. And so that's, I think, is the reason that uh, we go along with whatever common sense things Jack suggests, of, mm -hmm. but having in mind these uh, potential uh, drastic downpours that can cause erosion. All right, super. Uh, Janet? I think we do need some clarity about what the term disturbance means because, you know, as, you know, not being an expert in solar arrays, but when I think about it, um, you know, clearing the site, you know, establishing vegetation, putting up your, um, your erosion controls is one thing, right? But then if you, when you put all the equipment in, that's a huge disturbance again. So if you had 50 acres that was, you know, you had seeded and put in your erosion controls and then you're digging it all up again and you start having rain or the, the controls fail. That I think is the disaster scenario that, you know, people have seen. And I, you know, I talked to the Palmer um, thing and erosion was a huge problem for them and stabilizing sites. So, you know, maybe having better slopes will help, but, you know, 50 acres of erosion is different than 10 acres. And so I think I'm guessing that disturbance of the site is digging, you know, digging the stuff. So, and putting things in. Um, but I think it'd be good to get clarity on that because it's we're all going to need that when you implement it. I, I'd like to raise the question. I have a big arching question. So Chris clarified that these red things are in addition to um, the, the million other stormwater things. I had sent around um, some recommendations from the National Renewable Energy Lab, and I think the University of Wisconsin or Minnesota, I can never can remember, apologies to that state, saying that um, solar arrays need different stormwater controls because, you know, the rain hits and then it slides off and it, you know, it kind of falls off on a drip edge, which hardens the soil and things like that. I think Jack saw that. I have no expertise in this area, but I'm wondering, um, are there stormwater controls for arrays that are different than the normal stuff? And I've read some stuff where, you know, there's like a little weird thing in Massachusetts memo saying, yeah, it's different, but we haven't enacted that yet. So I was just going to ask Jack, is these these solar array stormwater management controls, are they different, better, needed? Are we missing something? Um, I'd love to have the answer to that because I feel like if the federal National Renewable Energy Lab is saying, let's do something different for this. I think we should really do that too. But I don't know what the difference is because it's it's beyond my ability. Go ahead, Jack. You have a yeah, I um I I would say that um it really depends. Well, if we're talking like conversion of force to to solar, that that's one thing. But you know, and if we're talking about conversion of agricultural land or or other uh you know fallow type land to solar that's that's another so each each of the sites have uh unique uh situations that would be presented to the developer and the permit granting authority in terms of uh and the engineer especially with regard to how to 
uh, do the erosion controls. But in and of itself, the the there's short term with the construction, and then there's long term with regard to the the established solar array. There's two different kind of stormwater issues that you're looking at. You know, so but in and of itself, that that situation where you you're looking at the water coming off a panel, which is say you know six feet by ten feet, that in and of itself is not uh, erosive in nature. I mean, you think of a gutter off a roof, you know, that's 20 foot high. You know, this is going to be on the order of six to eight feet. And the area of those panels aren't that large. So, yes, you know, there there will be, you know, a drip line. But then you also have, you have a lot of vegetation. The whole area is going to be vegetated. Um, and it really just kind of... Um, is is buffered by the fact that the the ground is grass beneath the solar so it, there's not enough energy to where those types of rains for for an established site can really do damage with regard to uh erosion is my understanding and then you know again here we are in humid new england there's a lot of studies you know in in other areas it's a different matter you know like in an arid situation where you get you know a uh a, a, a cloud burst and <laughs> because they're already susceptible to 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 erosion because as uh, the nature of you know no no vegetative cover whatsoever out there and it's, it's a different story so uh that's that's all i guess i can say on that mark so for in our world i don't think there's anything unique uh about the stormwater or excuse me about a a solar array and special provisions that need to be made uh specifically because there's solar panels there before beside other than uh, say some other type of land development hey, thanks jack yeah martha uh, yes yeah. stephanie could you quickly put up that that slide with the four principles that i sent you because i i read you know many of those documents that that uh, janet and jack are referring to and it seemed that there were uh what came through in every single one of them was what that I took a snapshot of four basic principles that have to be applied that that somewhere in our in our bylaw these get uh, put in and I if Stephanie if you could put that up because I think we've covered uh, much of them but if we could just quickly see that I see yeah there that this seemed to be what all the documents were basically talking about and so if we have the requirement somewhere in that you know there has to be this um you know as part of the initial report they have to do the uh study of the of the soil the soil compaction and and the density and the soil depth and then you know what you're dealing with in terms of what you need for erosion. And then as Jack has mentioned, establishing the vegetative ground cover. And then fourth is something that Janet had brought up with farmland, but again, the distance between the arrays so that you do have enough space uh, for the water then that runs off to, to filter in. So it would seem that somewhere in our bylaw, though these four things should get uh, inserted, and that seemed to be common to all these documents. So, I mean, maybe I can ask Chris. I mean, to what extent are some of these things already infused in some of those other laws, um, or in some of the language we have so far? Um, it seems to me that what's written here applies more to um, agriculture, but I'm not sure. But I do think that a lot of these things are already um, incorporated into the documents that are listed in the beginning of this section. Um, so, you know, uh, I can look into that. Um, Stephanie may be a good person to talk mm -hmm. about this with because she used to be the conservation officer in Amherst and she was often dealing with um, issues related to runoff and things like that. I. So I will look at the documents that we list to see if these four items are incorporated into them. 
Yeah, because I mean, I, I think we do have language about ground cover and so forth. Um, the distance between the arrays, I, I don't know if that's so much of an issue for what um, Jack just told us. And also, at least in the north, northern latitudes, arrays economically will just be spaced out uh, further than they are in, in southern um, latitudes. Um, Jack? Yeah, I was going to say, th th this seems more like of a, uh, what, a higher level kind of guidance, um, which is appropriate. This is this is all good. But when it comes down to a bylaw, I'm not, not sure that we need to get in the weeds, uh, you know, like this. I, I just don't think it's, um, it, I, it just, it's just, Verbiage, I think, it is already taken by, uh, accounted for by all the references that we listed initially, um, you know, for in that stormwater section that, that Chris went over. Uh, there's just best management practices. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I don't know how you, you would fit this in, but I, it doesn't seem necessary uh, to me. Because, I mean, there's already state documents that they have to abide by that I think, I think take so. all this into account. All right. Great, Jack. Thanks. Um, Jan, and just a, a heads up, we have about five more minutes, and then we want to um, hear from our um, other attendees. Yeah, I think I'm down to 15 seconds. Um, I, you know, speaking as a planning board member, I, 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 this kind of information would be really helpful to a citizen on the ZBA or the planning board who didn't understand all the depth that Jack has. Um, and I wonder if it could be worked in, in a way that kind of is informative to in the bylaw that says, you know, these are the things to look for. So I just, that's one thing. The other thing I want to talk about maybe quickly is I was a little bit lost between the hundred foot buffer and the 400 foot buffer, like hundred feet for private wells, 400 for public drinking water supplies. And I thought that, you know, what if we just did 400 for everything and that would take care of people's concern about groundwater recharge. And also it's not that far, but I think it would, I don't know if it overlaps with other buffers and some a little buffer zoned confused. <laughs> You know, so I think simplicity, consistency, 400 feet isn't that long. If you're worried that you're not going to have recharge for your well, that might be feel good. I'm not sure why we had 400 feet for public water supplies. And so I'm just kind of like lost in that maze. And it, it doesn't have to be resolved right now, but I'm a little not clear. I mean, Jack can maybe speak to that. My recollection is that a public water well is thousands, if not tens of thousands of times as much um draw from yeah the, from the um but from what the do you table. what's the purpose of a 400 foot buffer zone that would it be served well so there, the, that's the zone one uh for a public water well is 400 feet and that's been hardwired into any municipal or community water supply for you know the last 50 years and then okay. they have a zone two which is uh something that's more directly uh, contributing to the well that is focused more on this upgradient sand and gravel aquifer. And then zone three is the watershed that contributes into the zone two. So the zone one is 400 feet and it's been protective. It's got a history of decades of being protective for these municipal wells, which pump, you know, thousands times more than a private well. And that's where the, the zone of influence of a private well is smallish to where we're setting you know septic systems back 100 feet any you know an oil tank would be set back 100 feet all these things that have a much greater threat to a private well are 100 feet so why go 400 feet for a solar field which is innocuous basically you know why uh, go for you have under so I, i'm sorry jack but why go 400 feet for the public drinking water supply like could you have an oil tank a hundred feet away from it and still protect that supply or like what's the purpose of the buffer zone to just give space for recharge or make sure nothing leaches in right but the 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 community wells are pumping so much water that it, it is a they, they're influence in an area that is enveloping that that buffer zone uh there's a there's a rigorous you know 
communication between the land use within the 400 feet and that community well. Whereas a private well is is like taking, you know, uh, you got to think of orders of magnitude in terms of the area of influence of a private well, that it is only taking a few hundred gallons a day versus millions of gallons a day. It, it's okay. more like it's just, the, the, 100 foot is more, you know, is is has a history of being protective of the private wells of known contaminant sources, which I mentioned, tanks, septic systems. So that's why that's a that's a no-brainer number to use for right, private good. wells. Yeah, good. Okay, Bob, and then let's um yeah, just real quickly, Janice said it's relatively insignificant. 30 100 square foot buffer is 31,000 square feet. A 400 foot buffer is 500,000 square feet. It's a significant difference. Yeah. All right. So good. Um, so, Chris, does that give you sort of for this um, for this stormwater area? Does that give you the feedback we need? You need yep. at this point. Mm -hmm. That's good. Right. Yep. Thank you. All right. Good. So, uh, Martha, and then we'll. Yes. yes. So, Dwayne, in the in these next two minutes, then we really need to. Um, think hard and get organized. It seems to me that the things we've covered today that that Chris, um, you know, if you've <laughs> either taken good notes or listened to the recording or something, you'd be able to incorporate uh, the comments today pretty much. And uh, then as soon as you can send around a draft uh, for people to look at mm -hmm. uh, in advance of the meeting. And so it seems then we have several things. Our charge for this committee was not just to draft the bylaw, but it was also to look at the look at the maps, make recommendations of where we thought that that solar was most appropriate, and then also to write a, a sort of a report that gave kind of quote guidance and and direction and et cetera, et cetera as was mentioned today, like direction to the planning board or ZBA and so on. And here it is, September 15th. Uh, you're gonna be away October 6th. This is due. How are we gonna get there from here? Um, I think I've- And I've, I've, it before public comments. <laughs> yes. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, I don't know, I, I would take, um, some guidance from uh, Chris and Stephanie with regard to the other deliverables. Uh, you know, I think the main focus is the is the draft bylaw recommend recommendations um, for the uh, council and the man town manager. Um, I've always been a little bit reluctant to start drawing preferences on a map myself, um, but um, uh, but. Um, I guess we'll need to to address those issues, um, and wouldn't mind hearing from S Stephanie or Chris on that. But Janet first. Sorry, I'm I'm, I'm muted myself. I raised this issue a, a year ago about what our charges, and so I don't think the um I think we can do the rest of the things. I don't know if we can do it by October sixth. I'd be happy to do a first draft. I mean, we're supposed to, you know, what are the community values, and I think that would be easy, you know, based on the survey and. You know, I feel like you look at Amherst and you can literally physically see the community values. Um, you know, the the solar survey gives the priority locations. Um, and then, you know, we have all this expensive mapping that we did. And, you know, where are the where are the places for, you know, large scale solar or whatever, you know, and so we have some mystery areas, which are the universities and colleges, which actually have the largest areas. But I think that information is also around, but I'd be happy to sort of do an outline providing those things and getting it done. It doesn't, you know, I don't have to always put the burden on Chris and Stephanie who seem beyond busy. Um, and, you know, we, we, we have firepower here and, you know, putting together a report or a summary and having people comment on it is, you know, straight in my wheelhouse in terms of what I can do. Yeah, I wasn't suggesting that Steph, we would burden Stephanie or Chris with that, but just their take on what what the council or the what town, these... the town council's charge is really clear, and it repeats it over and over again. Do we need? I mean, 
is there any lack of clarity when you read the charge about what we were supposed to do? You know. Yeah. Uh-huh. Well, there there is some. I mean, to some extent, in terms of the mapping, I uh, I don't want to put you know draw my preferences or even the committee's preferences of where we think solar should go. Um, I definitely view that the the work that uh, GZA did on our behalf and and the town's behalf, I should say, um, is really where we would want to go uh, with with regard to that deliverable, um, as well as um, their they they did a write up already of the of the um, survey results and so forth. So that could be we could write a a memo around that and with that as sort of the appendices as the as part of the deliverable. But I wouldn't mind getting uh, just Stephanie and Chris, is you, any your thoughts you have in terms of guidance of what we might put together on, on those other deliverables. May I speak? Yeah, please. Uh, I think, you know, we have a map. We have that interactive map, and that gives us a lot of information about um, where solar is feasible. Um, it's And we have uh, zoning, and I had sent um, a chart showing how solar could be permitted in various zoning districts. We haven't looked at it yet, but um, essentially it's um, special permit everywhere except for I think the PRP zoning district. Um, So I feel like we don't actually need a map that shows that we prioritize solar in this location and we forbid it in some other location. I think there are a lot of unknowns and if we have, you know, the the zoning bylaws set up to require um, the Zoning Board of Appeals to review most uh, solar installations. And we have five that have been approved so far. And as far as I know, we haven't had trouble with them. Um, one of them is being constructed now. But, um, you know, I feel like the Zoning Board is pretty capable of reviewing these things. And, and I don't really think that we have to have a map that shows here we want them, here we don't want them. I think that there are so many unknowns. The solar developers, um, you know, have a lot of criteria that we don't necessarily, you know, we, we're not privy to. And if we want solar to happen in Amherst, I don't think we should put too many restrictions on it. So the map that we have is a resource for everybody. It's a resource for the boards and committees and for citizens as well as solar developers. But I don't think we should put together a map that says here and not here. Okay, let me, um, I do want to give the public their their opportunity. So let me uh, suggest and anybody who wants to um, sort of put together some thoughts and outlines of what these other reports might look like. I would agree with Chris. I think we have the material. It's more writing a memo uh, uh, around them. Um, uh, if anybody wants to offer to do that or, or work on that, we can, we can, we uh, can, um look at that at our at our next meeting and discuss in earnest how we're going to get get over the finish line on that as well um i do want to hear from the uh attendees uh here so hopefully we will be meeting twice more um and we'll work on that scheduling with uh so look out for stephanie's doodle poll coming up okay let me um um anybody from the attendees, and, and I'll say we have 11 for the record uh, listening now. Um, anybody would who wants to make a comment, if you can raise your hand and then Stephanie can um, unmute you. Scott, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, a couple comments. Um, one in regards to the threshold for compensatory mitigation for impacts to forest land. Um, if the if the threshold is 10 acres, I suspect that you're going to get a lot of 9.9 acre projects. And there's two implications of that. One is, does the bylaw need to clarify that the 10 acre threshold is a cumulative total per property so that you don't have a 9.9 acre project and then a year later you have another 9.9 acre project you know on the same property right next door 
Um, and then the other is, does having a bunch of 9.9 .9 acre projects that don't have to provide compensatory mitigation undermine the objective of, of what um, the town is trying to do here? Um, so that might be a reason for lowering the threshold, um, but that's something to consider. Um, the other uh, thing that I wanted to bring up was the issue of um, criteria for mitigation land. And one thing that I've seen a lot is, um, you know, there's sort of a concentric circles. Um, and so, you know, ideally the mitigation would be within the town um, that if that's not possible, then um, what's frequently used is within the same watershed. Um, and if that's not possible, um, you know, then it would be further out. Um, oftentimes, uh, when you get into that scenario, the mitigation ratio increases. So um, there's sort of a tiered approach. If you had two to one for mitigation in the town, maybe it's, you know, two and a half or three to one for mitigation in the same watershed and four to one if it's further out. But I do think it's important to establish criteria for the mitigation land. Whoops, thank, uh, thanks, Scott. All right, anybody, any other public comments? All right. An unusually bashful group. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um. Let me just mention. I, I think Scott makes a good point. I, as he was saying that, we could we could have another way to slice is maybe five to ten acres. You need to do one to one, five to ten acres, or more, ten or more acres. You need to do two two to one. Uh, but I get his point also in terms of um, whether it should be a multiplier depending on how proximate it is to the town. So things we can take up. I'm not sure uh, if Scott is raising his hand again, or is this yeah. just a holdover from before? Oh, come on. That was a holdover from before. Okay. Sorry. Thanks, Scott. Okay, um, Janet right. Keller. Yeah, I just wanted to say one thing, which is um, that it would be important to... Uh, factor in what we've learned about uh, extreme weather um, th this year in into all of these deliberations and um, particularly um, in uh, protecting uh, downstream properties from the erosion and um, I would think it would be good to look at um, how many households are actually um, in the path of the um, runoff from from uh, some uh, obviously the the one that's uh, being uh, permitted now, but. Um, some of the other obvious places. Thanks. All right, thank you, Janet. Okay, uh, any other public comment? We have one more, or, or no, uh, uh, two more now, so, okay. Uh, Jenny Kallick. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you. That was a great session. To circle back to community engagement, I believe the Engage Amherst website still has solar bylaw there from the uh, survey. Stephanie can help us maybe understand that. 
except for the group who's been enjoying all these sessions, the rest of the community doesn't realize that the uh, draft is almost finished. Could we consider either posting the draft for the whole community to have a look uh, or have a link to your last session? So the same people who participated in the survey and beyond that could have an opportunity to send you comments and weigh in so that the uh, charge that the community values and point of view be incorporated could have full circle uh, as you're finishing your work. So just the suggestion of giving a broader uh, information to a larger community other than our little group who's been following you with great devotion uh, would know that the draft is about to be finished. Thank you everybody uh, for all the great work and devotion to that, we appreciate it. Okay, hey, thank you, Jen Jenny. All right, Steve, Steve. Steve yep. Mm -hmm. uh, good afternoon, this is Steve Rofe from South Amherst. I'm speaking for myself. I just wanted to raise one issue. I know it was raised in, in your meetings by some of your members. Just remember that protecting lands from solar is not the same as protecting lands. And um, I think you've had discussion before about the perverse incentives and the danger that if you make it difficult or impossible to develop solar on some lands, landowners may develop that in other ways. So as you go through and finalize your your restrictions on solar development, just keep in mind um, that perverse incentive concept so you don't inadvertently cause worse developments than solar. Keep up the great work. I, I'm, I'm rooting for you to finish by your deadline. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Renee Ren Ren Moss. Yeah. Oh, God. Hi. Um, once uh, Renee Moss, Shrewsbury Road. Um, once again, thank you for all your hard work, and we know this is. I just want to make one comment, not um, specific to any one thing that was discussed today, but um, many of us, and I, I thank you, Duane, so much for your department putting on these um, these sessions about um, solar. And many of us have spent many Zoom hours after only two sessions, I think seven hours. The other day with everything going on, I was on for nine hours. But, um, but these sessions, I think, and I know I've seen some of you on these sessions, have been so helpful and so informative and are really rolling out what the Healy administration, what scientists are seeing as 2023 science. And I feel like what is rising to the surface, no pun intended, of, of these sessions is that we really need to try to avoid developing solar as much as possible on forested land. And I feel like when we don't pay attention to this, we're, we're applying 2018 science to what we're trying to plan for 2023. The upside of um, Amherst not having a solar bylaw is that we now have the opportunity to use 2023 science as the basis for a bylaw that we develop. And, you know, I, I just think, you know, we sit through, you know, hours and hours of these sessions with all these fabulous presentations, and I feel like we come here and a lot of that is ignored. So I hope that what we are learning at this moment in time, we're at a pivotal moment in time, a tipping point where the science is looking, is, is different. We really need to embody this into our bylaw and make the, the best use of what we know now, not what we knew in 2018 or 2017. So thank you for your hard work and I hope you will incorporate all this amazing stuff. And particularly Dwayne, I wanna thank you for this for these four Tuesdays, they're 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 fantastic. I just feel like I'm learning so much. Thank you. Appreciate that, <clears throat> Renee. Thank you. The sessions are excellent. I I'm halfway through the first one, and I saw the second one. Just amazing. It's really a stellar crew. 
Yeah. The second one is is particularly re relevant for our work, and so yeah. to our members. If you haven't listened to that, it's it's worth going back and listening to the recording. Okay. Uh, seeing no more comments from the public, and that we are right on time. Um, thank you, everybody. Great progress. A lot still in front of us. Let's plan to make similar um, progress in the next two, hopefully, sessions that we can schedule. And apologize, because uh, I know Stephanie will most likely not be able to find a time that works for all of us. Um, and so we're going to have to work through that in some way. Uh, but uh, um, do respond to Stephanie quickly so we can get these on our schedules um, as soon as we can. OK. All right. And uh, to Stephanie and Chris, thank you so much for your dedication work. Uh, I know you both are um, so busy on so many different things. All right. OK, have a good rest of the afternoon and a weekend. Yep. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.